All right, well, uh, we are working our way through Old Testament survey still. So uh, this week we'll be studying Kings together. Last week we studied 2 Samuel. In the first week that I was here with us, we studied 1 Samuel. Of course, Frank went through Ruth and Judges uh, for us before that. So we're going to cover all of Kings this week, and then all of Chronicles will be in the following week. So again, really high level, and especially we're trying to understand the flow of the story from Genesis now to Kings. And to do that, again, one of the things, and Frank referenced it this morning, one of the things we have to keep in mind is the way the flow works is different, whether you're in our English Bibles versus a Hebrew Bible. So in our English Bibles, uh, Chronicles does follow Kings. And again, it's very historical. And after that, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And it takes us chronologically through the creation of our world all the way down to the exile and the return to Jerusalem in historical order. The Hebrew canon is a little bit different in that after Kings, we go straight into Isaiah. So we go straight into what we call our prophets. And so for Kings, this is the end of a section. And that's gonna become really important to understand the purpose of the book of Kings and how it fits. Again, there's good to both orderings. I like the chronological ordering of the English, which follows the, the Latin. Um, but I like also the Hebrew ordering because, you're gonna, as we're going to see today, Kings is a very significant end. And so to see it in that ordering is really important. And, and Isaiah is a great next book for what we read in Kings today and what we see the point of Kings is. Okay, so to understand, uh, again, we're going to see how there's this story. This is kind of a silly uh, slide, but it just shows all these books are linked. Don't think of them as separate books. Think of the Bible as one book, and think of these as, as kind of chapters in the book. And really, even that's not fair, because as we said before, the, the division between, as we said last week, the division between Judges and 1 Samuel is almost a smaller division than between 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. And so sometimes, be, because it's one book, the Bible is one book. You see connections even between books like that. But my point in this slide is just to show there's these connections, and we're going we're gonna to continue the story on through Kings here. This will, uh, this will be new to Charles and Finita because I did this last week, but um, we flew through it, and I'm going to just throw them up here again this week. But we talked about how not to be confused with sort of the major covenants that we studied previously when we talked about the Abrahamic and the Mosaic and the Davidic, and the New, and I left out a few, like the Priestly. But uh, we talked about how there are these promises that God makes, these covenants, uh, that God makes to individuals, starting with Noah, and how we see a similar story that works through. And we talked about the reason we did this in 2 Samuel, is 2 Samuel 1.1 started with a Hebrew word that we showed last week that sort of marks a division. It's called a macrosyntactical particle, and it marks a division. We talked about how it said, now it happened after the death of, was a kind of a way, like we would say in English, once upon a time, right? And you know, oh, a new story is starting, or a new division is starting. And we talked about how you can, you can look at those throughout the Old Testament, and you can see how the story sort of, you know, comes to a, sort of the chapter comes to a conclusion, and another one picks up. And then that story follows a very similar sort of pattern, and then it finishes and another one picks up. And I'm going to just throw all those stories up here just uh, by review. So we talked about how God made a promise to Noah and how there was failure after that promise and what he, you know, he said, hey, I'm not going to flood the world again. I'm not going to destroy the world again, but, you know, scatter, be dispersed, populate the earth. And they failed to do that. And then we talked about how God in mercy comes and renews a new covenant with a new group, despite the fact mm -hmm. that Humanity has failed, or whoever he's covenanted with has failed. God doesn't give up on them. He makes a covenant with a new group and starts afresh. And so we talked about how he did that with Abraham. He picked Abraham out of the world and said, I'm going to start and I'm going to covenant with you. But then Abraham, you know, as he was told to wait for a son, he grew impatient and, and brought Hagar on. We talked about how often there's these two two aspects of each story where you know God covenants with Abraham in Genesis 15 and then he re-covenants with him again in Genesis 17. And then you see it comes about after the death of Abraham and, and the story continues. And so after the death of Abraham, you know, 
What comes next? They go down in Egypt. We talked about how God is going to make uh, a covenant with them there as well because there's failure with the brother selling their kids, to, brother selling Joseph into Egypt. There's failure in that respect. It was part of God's plan, but um, they're not acting the way that God wanted them to, but God takes the nation of Israel out of that. He forms a nation out of that and covenants with them on Mount Sinai. And we talked about how this story, and I'm just going to flip through these fast now because we talked about them in more detail last week. Um, it just continued. That same pattern continues uh, throughout the Old Testament up until uh, where we are studying kings. It came about after the death of Moses. Then, you know, we have Joshua, is who God covenants with, and Joshua dies. We have the period of the judges and all the failure there. And then we get into what we studied in 1 Samuel where God... You know, they asked for a king, which was kind of the lowest point, but God, in grace, made a covenant. Here's what I'll do with you and your king. If your king will obey, everything will be well. Um, but, of course, it wasn't. Saul wasn't willing to even wait the seven days that God asked him to wait. And so God judges Saul, and he starts a new covenant, the Davidic covenant, with David. And that's where we were last week. So you'll remember we talked about David failing. So he... When the army is out to war, David does, acts in a way that he shouldn't. He takes Bathsheba, and that is going to bring God's judgment on him. And we see that in this book of 2 Samuel as David's having to run away from Absalom as a result of his sin. But we talked about how um, there's going to be one of David's sons. So even though David has failed, God is going to set up the covenant with one of David's sons. It was even a provision of the Davidic covenant that his sons would always have someone to sit on the throne. And we talked about how um, we, we knew that in 1 Kings we could expect this second aspect of the Davidic covenant, which is going to be his son Solomon. And let me go back here. Um, we talked about how it was the death of Saul. Uh, we talked about how after David failed, the next thing written... In, first, in 2 Samuel 12 is, a, is Solomon's birth. And so Solomon is set up as the one who's going to continue on the Davidic covenant. And sure enough, that's what we have in 1 Kings. We have all those aspects of the story that start 1 Kings. So let me show you. Um, again, we'll look at each of these passages, but we'll see the renewal of the covenant with, between God and Solomon. We'll see God coming down like he did in all those other aspects uh, where he filled the temple, you'll recall. And we'll see the same thing where God warned Solomon that if you don't keep my commandments, if you don't remain close, then, then I'm going to have to chastise and discipline you just like I have in all these stories before. So that's a really quick putting kings into where uh, this story goes, putting it in, into, the, uh, into the pattern sort of and also getting us up to speed where we're at. So in, in 1 Kings... Uh, we expect Solomon to carry on the Davidic covenant. He's the one that was introduced after David's failure. And sure enough, that's what we see as 1 Kings begins. So you can go ahead and turn to 1 Kings because we'll read some of these. But as I mentioned, Solomon's the first, uh, first name mentioned after David's failure and after God responds to that through Nathan. And we begin to see many things that remind us of David and how he... Uh, was chosen as the, as the king after God's own heart. So many things that remind us of the story of David in, in Solomon's own story. So remember David was selected instead of all his older brothers. We have the same thing in the case of Solomon. So you know, D David had seven other brothers. Um, so, and, excuse me, David had also many sons because he had several wives. And the first was killed. We don't read about Kileab anymore. I don't, we don't know. He kind of passes off the scene. Obviously, Absalom, who was his third son, is also dead. But Adonijah is the one that you would expect, based on sort of birth order, to take over the throne. And sure enough, he makes preparations to do that. But Solomon is chosen by the Lord, just like David was chosen over his older brothers. If you read, and that's where we'll begin to read a little bit, if you read in 1 Kings 2 you can begin to see in the first two chapters, which, by the way, the first two chapters of Kings end, the structurally, end the story of Samuel. So despite the fact there's this division between Samuel and Kings, you can see that sort of ends the story. Of, it's when David dies, and you can begin to see the torch passing on to Solomon. 
So in 1 Kings 2, we'll read and we'll see, the point of all this is I want you to see and listen and hear the Davidic covenant in each of these because that's what the author wants us to hear. As David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon his son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man, and keep the charge of Yahweh your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies, according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that Yahweh may carry out his promise which he spoke concerning me, saying, and tell me where this is from, if your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. That's clearly from the Davidic covenant. So as Solomon, as, as David begins to pass off the scene, again, we see in each of these episodes, we're going to see a reference to the Davidic covenant. Because our hope is that Solomon is going to, God is going to renew that through Solomon, even though David has failed, as he's promised to do. So David felt like that was going to be the case, and as he instructed Solomon, we see that. Now look at when Adonijah, uh, look at Adonijah's demise. So Adonijah, even after Solomon was identified as the one who was going to be the king, he asked uh, for the hand in marriage of the gal who cared for David in his old years. And Solomon didn't like that at all. But look at the response and, and hear the Davidic covenant in this as well. Then King Solomon swore by Yahweh, saying, May God do so to me and more also, if Adonijah has not spoken this word against his own life. This is verse 24 now of chapter 2. Now therefore, as Yahweh lives, who has established me and set me on the throne of David my father, and who has made me a house as he promised. Again, that's all Davidic covenant language. God promised to make David a house in response to David asking to make a house for him. Okay, now even when Abiathar, one of the priests who followed um, Adonijah wrongly, when he's dismissed, listen to what Solomon says to him in verse 26 of the same chapter. He says, Go to Anathoth, to your own field, for you deserve to die, but I will not put you to death at this time because you carry the ark of the Lord Yahweh before my father David and because you were afflicted in everything with which my father was afflicted. So, so Solomon dismissed Abiathar from being priest to Yahweh in order to fulfill the word of Yahweh which he had spoken concerning the house of Eli and Shiloh. I actually don't know why I called that out because I don't hear anything related to the Davidic covenant in there. Let's go on though. Maybe I'll do better this time. Verses 31 to 34 when Joab is, is kind of brought to bear for his sins against the king's house, the king said to him in verse 31, because Joab refused to leave the temple, he was holding on to the altar and he, he didn't want to leave. They were going to bring him out and, and judge him and execute him. He wouldn't, he wouldn't leave. So it says in 31, Do as Joab has spoken and fall upon him and bury him, that you may remove from me and from my father's house the blood which Joab shed without cause. And Yahweh will return his blood on his own head because he fell upon two men more righteous and better than he and killed them with the sword while my father David did not know of it. Abner, the son of Ner, commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, the son of Jether, commander of the army of Judah. So shall their blood return on the head of Joab and on the head of his descendants forever. But to David and his descendants and his house and his throne may there be peace from Yahweh forever. So again, in each of these stories, Solomon is clearly, and the author is clearly positioning him as carrying on the Davidic covenant. I'm not going to read Shimei's demise, but you'll see the same there. Uh, and as I mentioned, that really completes the story of Samuel. So we're ready now for Solomon to carry on the Davidic throne, to receive all the promises that were a part of that covenant, and really to bless Israel and through Israel the world. And sure enough, Solomon fulfills that to a great degree. So as you see in 1 Kings 3, as Solomon's story begins, there is a warning that Solomon uh, took a wife, a foreign wife, but beyond that, it's, it's noted that he loves God. Um, sure enough, God appears to Solomon, as we said, in, in a bit of a theophany. He, he grants him wisdom. Um, there's the story of the women where Solomon is able to discern and, and execute real wisdom and how to tell who, who should receive this baby. Even kind of harkens back to when you know David uh, was unable to determine uh, whether Mephibosheth or Shimei was telling the truth. Do you remember that story where Shimei said, hey, you know, 
Mephibosheth is hoping now that you're on the run from Absalom to get the throne back. And then Mephibosheth comes back later and says, well, no, he left me and I was lame. And David can't really sort it out and he just kind of splits it evenly, right? I mean, Solomon is showing even greater wisdom than his father David in this. Uh, the government of Solomon, uh, there's some works of Solomon with Hiram. Let me see what these notes are that I have uh, on there to see if that's something that I want to call out. Okay, it's just talking about how, especially verse 25 of chapter 4, so Judah and Israel lived in safety, every man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba. So it's just describing this period of, of really um, fabulous peace and safety and prosperity for Israel. So Solomon really is fulfilling uh, the Davidic covenant and God is, is beginning to show uh, exactly what life could be like as those who are righteously following him. Sure enough, God built, Solomon builds his temple for God, which was David's original desire. And then a really key chapter uh, in the book, God comes, he inhabits the temple that's built for him, and he's living once again in the midst of Israel in Jerusalem you know, as sort of walking among his people, God is their God, and all is, is fabulous. Israel, in this, in this period we mentioned in 2 Samuel with David and in 1 Kings with Solomon, we don't read about the Assyrians, we don't read about the Philistines, we don't read about the Egyptians that much, because Israel was the glorious nation at that time. They were the powerful and glorious nation. Okay, and then we, as we mentioned, we see sort of that renewal of the Davidic covenant. I'll go ahead and read that in chapter 9. But you can see both God saying, yes, I am renewing this covenant with you, Solomon, but here you do need to be obedient for this to work out. So let's read just the first, first part of chapter 9. Now it came about when Solomon had finished building the house of Yahweh and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to do, that Yahweh appeared to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And Yahweh said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication which you have made before me when he was praying in front of all Israel at the, in the temple. I have consecrated this house which you have built by putting my name there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. And as for you, if you will walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and uprightness doing according to all that I have commanded you and will keep my statutes and my ordinances then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, just as I promised your father David, saying, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So here we have that sort of second renewal of the, of the covenant, like in all the other stories before. God has come down and he said, yes, I'm gonna, this covenant is going to be with you, Solomon. But, and here's the concern, if you or your sons indeed turn away from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, and you go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and the house which I have consecrated for my name, and I will cast out of my sight this house. So Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples, and this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone who passes by will be astonished and hiss and say, Why has Yahweh done thus to this land and to this house? And they will say, because they forsook Yahweh their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and adopted other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore Yahweh has brought all this adversity on him. So if we can just think back. He said this to Moses in that generation. right? He said, here's what's going to happen if you don't obey. And sure enough, he, he, made them teach, he taught them a song because he knew they weren't going to. And sure enough, that happened. It happened with the, with the king. When they, Israel asked for a king, he said, it'll be fine. I will still love you. But if your king doesn't do this, here's all I'm going to do. And sure enough, quickly after that, Saul does it. Now here again, he's saying this to Solomon. I'm going to establish my covenant with you, but if you don't follow me, here's what's going to happen. And just like in every story before, it's really fast how quickly uh, the covenant people, and in this case Solomon, turns away. In fact, take a good look at this. I should have done a better slide, but we're going to see each of these things work backwards in reverse. So we're going to see a story about the works of Solomon with Hiram, only this time Hiram's going to be disappointed in the cities that Solomon gives him. We're going to see a story about the government of Solomon. We're going to see another story about women. And then we're going to go back and we're going to see Solomon, a statement about his love, only this time it's going to say Solomon doesn't love God. It's going to say he loves other women. 
And so the author is going to just quickly unwind everything we've just read. So let me, again, Hiram unflees. That, that happens in the next part of chapter 9 that we didn't read. The government of Solomon with a sp specific note that the Canaanites were still dwelling in the land. Story of women and the wisdom of Solomon. In this case, it was the, the queen of Sheba who came. The glory of Solomon, the wisdom, and then the failure. And including, especially that he no longer, the statement is no longer, he did marry this Egyptian woman, but he loved God, which it was at the beginning of Solomon's. Now, it's a story of how he loves all these foreign women. And it's a story of Solomon's demise and how those women like Samson before him, turned his heart to other gods. And so, so quickly, all of this unwinds. In fact, if we read, and I won't read it all, but in 1 Kings 10 through 11, because I've got to stay a bit high level, um, all the things that were mentioned in Deuteronomy 17 about not having multiple, uh, not having lots of horses and not going back to Egypt and not uh, you know, raising yourself above your brethren, Solomon is explicitly said as doing each of those. And so we can see how Solomon has failed, just like everyone before him. And from that point on, the kingdom is split. You have all these really bad kings. In fact, seven kings on the northern kingdom are mentioned next, as well as some good, some bad kings on the southern, but all had their issues, uh, even the ones that were good. And we go through that, um, and I got a lot of this uh, from a book that I've mentioned before, David Dorsey, The Literary Structure of the Old Testament. Um, and then what's interesting, so again, here's where, that's the story we're on. And then all of a sudden, I don't have, I thought I had it at the bottom. I just want to remind you, we, we have this phrase that, that sort of happens after in each of these cases where the, when they begin to fail with the covenant, finally it says, now it came about after the death of, and then a new story begins. And we have that in 2 Kings 1 as well. So it lists the seven kings of the northern kingdom, with Ahab being a particularly bad king and one that's given a lot of ink uh, in, in kings, unlike some of the others, which is sort of short and then it moves on. You get a lot on Ahab, and then 2 Kings 1.1 1, 1 begins with, now it happened after the death of Ahab. And that's a trigger, again, for us as we're reading, to say, okay, something new is going to happen. Sure enough, the Davidic covenant has not flourished because of the sins of the kings. And sure enough, it's gone downhill. We're spiraling, just like we did in the book of Judges. We're spiraling down. We've gotten to Ahab, who's horrible. Jezebel is leading the nation to a large degree from her position as queen. And, and it's looking horrible. What's God going to do? Well, the author says, now it came about after the death of Ahab. So everything in us is going, hey, that's good. Once upon a time, right? That means a new story is starting. God's going to covenant in some other way with Israel. What's he going to do? And who comes on the scene after that? Who, who, are, who is introduced to us Ahaziah. in the story? Who? Ahaziah. Not Ahaziah. Elijah. Elisha. In this case, Elisha. So Elijah was there. but So it says, let me read 2 Kings 1. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Moab rebelled after Israel... Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell through the lattice, and he says, Go see Elijah the Tishbite. Or excuse me, they go and see Elijah the Tishbite. And, and soon after that is when Elijah goes off the scene and we're introduced to Elisha. Okay, and Elisha is going to be the prominent figure that picks up now. And it's really different. Like the book of Kings, both up to this point and after the story of Elisha, is going to be all about this king reigned in Israel. Here's who he fought against. Here's what he did. He reigned this long. He died. He goes on to the next king. That's what all of most of 1 Kings after Solomon and most of 2 Kings after Elisha. That's how the whole book is structured. But then right here in the middle is these eight or so, eight, nine, ten chapters about Elisha that have nothing to do with kings. It's just stories of Elisha. So again, as the reader, you're expected to think, hey, this is going to be the one that God covenants with. And then there's even clues in it. Um, so I'm going to just put up there, David to Elisha's covenant. That's the next story. Um, you have the promise of David's covenant. It's not working. There's been this failure. All the kings are going downhill. Um, the northern kingdoms aren't recognizing even the Davidic king, right? They've broken off completely. The southern kings aren't ruling in righteousness. So we're going to find God's going to come down in some theophany to Elisha and he's going to create some covenant to forgive them in mercy. And he's going to go on and he's going to work through Elisha. That's what we expect. 
but it never happens. In fact, let me let me go back before that, um, and just exp and just share um, some of the connections that would make you think Elisha is going to be the one that God covenants with. So, uh, or even Elijah, for that matter. Elijah was a forerunner, right, of of Elisha in many ways. Think about the story when Elijah went to Horeb when he ran away from Jezebel, right? Where he ran to Sinai and was didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. And he was up on the mountain and there was earthquakes and winds and fire. What did that what does that remind you of? It reminds you of Moses. Remember Moses? And why did what did Moses do up on, on Sinai? He got he got the law, he got the covenant, he got the, the, the tablets of stone, which were the heart of the covenant. Right? And what, is, what does God say to Elijah when he's there? Was he in the fire or in the earthquake or in the... No, right? He spoke to him in a still small voice and he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Go back and anoint Elisha. So, I mean, it's just... Again, it's not spelled out, but it sure seems like Elijah recognizes... He thinks the... He knows. He exaggerated a bit. But he knows Israel is going to pot, as it were. And he's looking to God to kind of solve it. And God says, No, Elijah, go back anoint Elisha, and he even says anoint, I don't remember the name of the king, but anoint such and such king of Syria, because they're going to, you know, it's not going to be like it was before Elijah. And Elijah runs off. He goes to anoint um, Elisha. Where is Elisha when he finds Elisha? Does anybody remember? He's on a, he's on a plowing with oxen, right? And he cuts up the oxen when he's done. And, and get, So what does that remind us of? It's a sacrifice. And who did that before him? Remember Saul? Remember the story of Saul and where he was out plowing and, and he was received word? And he, So we have all these. How about miracles? Elisha's full of stories of miracles. Where have we ever had miracles like that before? Moses, Moses right? So again, all these, there's all these things in the story that, that as a reader you're saying, hey, this is really good. God is going to intervene. He's going to step in. He's going to work through Elisha, a prophet in this case. You know, he was working through uh, the people or, or leaders like Moses. Then he started working through kings. Well, maybe God's going to work through prophets now. Um, even, there's even an anointing, which reminds us of how he signaled out the people that were going to be the new covenant bearers in the, in the case of David. But nothing happens. Again, there's no covenant made. In fact, Elisha just passes off the scene and is never heard from again. Uh, except one time in the New Testament, Jesus refers to him. But beyond that, there's no covenant made, nothing happens, and we get right back into the kings. And it's like, whoa, that wasn't what I expected in the story there. And it goes on, and instead what we get is we get 2 Kings 17 and 25, where God finally, and I say finally because, again, this is like the sixth or seventh story where God has forgiven, renewed covenant, and gone on, where God says, I'm not doing it anymore. He, allow, he, he in fact leaves, we'll learn about this in Ezekiel, he leaves the temple, he leaves them to, on their own, and he lets them be destroyed. And instead of two renewals to a new covenant, we have two destructions. We have the destruction of the northern kingdom in 2 Kings 17, and the destruction of the southern kingdom in 2 Kings 25. And it's the end of the story. And so, you know, if you've been reading along... That's not what you expected, you know. The story is like movies. They always, you know, we're on the seventh sequel, and every time before, the movie ends really good, you know. And this time, you're sitting in the movie theater, and you're expecting it to happen, and all you get is the judgment, and then the movie ends, and the credits roll. And you think, that's not the way I expected it to end. But God has sure enough put an end to Israel. He's ended his, by all, by all appears... He's ended his relationship with Israel. He's thrown them out and they're scattered among the nations and he's refused to renew covenant with them, which is what he did almost. I mean, he's, he's not done and we're going to learn about that. But that's it. So that's, that's what Kings brings us. That's how Kings, you have to set it in the midst of all those other stories to see how it's different than all the others because he, he set up Elisha as if he were going to renew covenant with him and he didn't. Now, that's why I think it's important to think of kings as this, as, as here in the canon, because this is, it, there is a significant end there. There's a whole section that ends, and now we're going to pick up with the latter prophets. And why that's important is because the latter prophets are the ones that are going to come in and say, 
here's why God did that. It was extremely just. I mean, the former prophets have already told us it was just because God has tried it seven times over. He's tried renewing covenant with them and they keep failing. But the latter prophets are going to come in and show even more why it was just God did what he did and really show the sin of Israel that he rebuked them and they didn't listen on. That's a big part of what the latter prophets do. A lot of talk of what Israel did wrong. But the other things the latter prophets are going to do is they're going to say Kings wasn't the end of the story. There is going to be one more covenant that's going to come. One to rule them all, to use Lord of the Rings terminology. There's going to be one more covenant that's going to, that's going to be the last. It's going to be a new covenant. It's going, to, it's going to change everything. But it's going to be for the future, and that's what the latter prophets are going to tell us. So, Kings is a significant end, and I think it's important that we view it that way, uh, which the, the good parts about the English canon, about it being in order, those are good, but you miss the fact that that was a really significant end of the story. Other ends, it was the end of Israel's leadership. So we had continued to find new, you know, whether Moses or Joshua or the judges or Saul or David or Solomon as kings. Um, this is it. God's going to send them out and Hosea is going to come later and say there's not going to be another king or prince in Israel until the end of days. And Israel is going to be without that. So it was a, it was a, I mean, they have folks that kind of help them, whether it's Ezra in the post-exilic period or Nehemiah that come in, but they're going to be without prince or king for all their days until the end. It was the end of Israel's land. So even, they're kicked out of it, and even as they come back, they're always harassed in their land. It's never like with Solomon or under Moses or under Joshua they're going to always be harassed in their land, even to this day. When they're back, even to this day, they're not, they don't own Jerusalem. They, don't, they can't go and worship as they please on it. They're, it's owned by an international body that's governing it. Um, they're there with the, the, a mosque on their holy site. I mean, so until the end, Israel's never going to own their land again the way that they did uh, in Kings and before. It's the end of God's covenant blessings. Now, we're going to see in Ezekiel... That God is, what we'll see in Ezekiel is God goes into exile with them, as it were. God's not a, uh, he's a great God, right? Even when he chastens his people and makes them leave and scatters them, you see him in Ezekiel going with them. And you see that in the writings. We'll see in the writings when Frank takes us through the writings, uh, how God is with his people and how he's working behind the scenes in Esther. But it's the end of the covenant blessings where he's dwelling among them, He's protecting them, fighting their battles, doing miracles, whatever it takes. It's the end. Kings is the end of that. It's gone. Um, it's the end of God's patience and compassion, Kings is. Over and over again. I, I've actually not counted, but all those slides, I guess there were about six or seven of them. He continued to show compassion. Like, really, Moses? Really, Joshua? Really, people? Why are you? I mean, I, I just told you to do these things, and it didn't take long at all for you to fail. But God's so compassionate and continues, even after long stretches of like the downward spiral of the judges, and then they ask for a king. He still has compassion. Well, that's the end in Kings. He no longer, he withdraws his compassion and mercy from them. It's the end of God dwelling in their midst. As I mentioned that already, sort of in passing, but he's, he's left them. He's no longer going to dwell in their midst. Even when they come back and they rebuild the, the temple, remember they're weeping. It doesn't look the same, and God never dwells it. The cloud never comes back. And when they rebuild it and Herod builds a temple, there's never God's presence in it. And finally, it's the end of, I don't think I, yeah, I don't, it's the end of revelation. And all I mean by that is, because um, there's clearly a lot more revelation to come, but it's, it shows this is what God has predicted in Moses from the very beginning, that these things were going to happen, that God was going to eventually tire of it. He was going to exile them and they were going to be scattered among the nations. And so we've reached, in Kings, we've reached that. And the only thing left is for them to come back and, and be God's people again and Him to restore them and Him give them a new heart. That's all that's left. So we've reached the end of the story in Kings other than that one thing. And we're going to find there's a lot... Oh, please. Wait, how long has it been then since, um, from Genesis or from Kings? Well, Kings is the time So from, from Abraham... So from the, we're going to learn, we're going to have, we're going to talk through how we learn biblical chronology in this lesson, and Solomon's going to start in 970. And so this comes in around 500, 586.
um, you know, in that, so in the exodus from Egypt was in 1400. So we're talking, uh, I mean, it depends on when you mark it. If you want to go all the way back to Noah, then you're, you're almost at 1500 years that he's been, because that's kind of the start um, where he covenants with them and says, I'm not, I'm going to be patient with you. I'm not going to destroy the world the way that I did. And then he continues over the span of about 1500 years of um, forgiving the people, recovenanting, and finally going no more. Except one more thing, which he is going to do, and that's what the rest of the story will unfold. So <clears throat> Jeremiah's ministry begins kind of toward the end of Second Kings, as far as timeline, yes. right? Um, how does that square up? I mean, is there, is, as far as Jeremiah talking about the New Covenant, does it fall within the time frame of the end of Kings? Yes, it does. Yeah, so he was he was ministering in that time period. But if you look, and it's you know Jeremiah actually dates a fair number of his things. But if you look in terms of the flow of the book of Jeremiah, it's going to be after. So the first part of Jeremiah is going to be, hey, you know, do what Babylon says, don't rebel against them, you know, and then ultimately they fall. Jerusalem falls, and he he begins to make prophecies about the future. And so it's in that time frame. It's unclear whether it was before the fall or after the fall. But um, that's, the, that's going to be the ministry of the latter prophets. We're going to find Isaiah uh, talks about who is going to bring the new covenant. Because it, you know, it didn't work with David. It didn't work with Moses. It didn't work with Solomon. It didn't work with Saul. Who is going to be the person? Jeremiah is going to talk about um, what the new covenant is going to be. Ezekiel is going to talk about where it's going to be. And then the 12 are going to talk about when it's going to be. So each of those are going to define that. It's going to be their role is defining that final covenant. So because the new covenant falls later in the book of Jeremiah, can we safely say that at least that part of it is, is after they've been taken into exile? Or is that not? I'm trying to think if I can think of a way to pin down that they would have had this revelation before or not. And I can't think of a way to, okay. to prove or show that it happened either before or after. Just because the, the latter prophets are going to, they're going to be so different where it's not going to be chronological. And so it's really hard to know when they preached these sermons and people heard them. Um, I mean, certainly, even in Moses, they knew that, that they were going to be exiled and God was going to give them a new heart and bring them back. So I think the new covenant was before, way before in that sense, sure. when the latter prophets did, I don't know. Um, okay, so it's a significant end, and uh, and all the writings and the prophets now are going to be say, "How long, God? When are you going to? You know, we knew this is this was going to happen. You had planned it all out. We did wrong. I mean, Daniel. I'm going to talk about Daniel if I don't run out of time. You know, they're all going to look back and and they recognize that God was just in this, and the righteous remnant are waiting for God to do the last step, which we're still waiting for at this point, although He's done a part of it and. In bringing Jesus. Okay, so the structure of kings. Uh, again, this is modified from that book that I that I enjoy so much. Um, but let me just throw it up there. So uh, again, we have the beginning of the Davidic kingdom, which is paired with the end of the Davidic kingdom at the end of books. We have the beginning of the northern kingdom and the end of the northern kingdom. And then again, there's a lot of ink around Ahab's kingdom. I'll go off the record here again like I did uh, some weeks before, but you think about uh, why God chose to use Elijah and Elisha as the ones to tell the story, to tell the story of who He didn't covenant with. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna. We at least know that Elijah was picked as the forerunner of Christ, right? John the Baptist was came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, and Malachi said that Elijah was going to come, and that helps us to see that, you know, when they read this book of Kings, they recognized. This and they said, "Hey, Elisha is supposed to be the one that was covenanted with, and Elijah was his forerunner." And so, when Jesus comes, you think about what a lot of his life was like. It was very similar to Elisha. I mean, even some of the stories, healing lepers, raising the dead, many things that Elisha did. And I think, again, this is off the record, and I think it's. I think there are types in the Bible that I don't want to go on the record as saying they are because you can be wrong very easily. Um, and that's why I, I prefer when the New Testament or someone that's more that is inspired uh, uh, recognizes a type. But I think Elisha, uh, you know, in many ways, you see Jesus come and fulfill that ministry of His, um, and that's the one that God is going to covenant with, and and is going to covenant with, and is never going to fail. There's going to be no concern that He fails, and we see the 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 temptation in the wilderness, for instance. 
as that period of, will Jesus wait? Will he, will he wait and be patient? At the end of 40 days, Satan comes and he tempts them with the world and everything and Jesus succeeds. And it's like, hey, that's never happened before, you know? But I say all that to say that it's interesting to see Elisha is the one that the author, that God as the author put there as the one we expected a covenant with because there's so many ways his ministry is like Jesus. And in so many ways, John the Baptist's ministry was like, and even is called, a, a forerunner like Elijah. Okay, so there's the structure of kings. And again, that, that center section is, um, is about the prophet Elisha that I just discussed. So purpose statement. Um, Purpose statement of kings very negative. It's a very negative book uh, because again, it's it's the it's the it's a cutting off. I mean, you you should be crying after the book of kings. That's you know on, on all the other ones, you should be rejoicing and praise and thanks for what God has done and being merciful. Well, not, not at kings. It should leave you uh, in tears. Um, God severely disciplines them in accordance with covenant curses because of their wickedness, and He refuses to covenant again. But the prophets are exhibited. You think before Kings, other than a little bit in Samuel, we have not thought much about prophets. But in Kings, prophets become very front and center. In fact, when we talk about themes, we're going to see prophets are a big theme in Kings. And that just prepares us for the latter prophets and what they're going to do in carrying the story on. Okay, major themes, definitely Kings um, is a major theme in the book of Kings. So David is the pattern uh, Solomon is really, to be honest, the, the highest embodiment of what a king is going to be in Israel. I mean, if, if you want to think about what the millennial kingdom is going to be like in seed form, you look at what Solomon did before his fall. I mean, that's what the glories of that, people streaming from other places to come see it, coming to Jerusalem to hear wisdom, um, just the riches of it, that's what the millennial kingdom is going to be like. It was, in, in large measure... A fulfillment of everything God had promised to Israel. I mean, the words that are used of Solomon in that time, where he ruled from, is exactly what was promised to Abraham. So I don't believe that he fulfilled Abraham and it's done. Some people would tell you that it was fulfilled in Solomon's day, and so now there's no future for Israel in the land. I'm not saying that. I'm saying for the short time he was there, he was fulfilling, God was fulfilling what he promised to Abraham to give them a land and give them greatness. It didn't last. And it's going to last one day. He is going to give it to them through Jesus, and it is going to last. But during that time, it was a picture of what it's going to be like in the future. And you can think, for somebody living in that time, Absolutely. They, they would think it was a fulfillment. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that in each of these cases, and we'll talk about this in Isaiah even more, you know, when, they, when, when I'm living in David's time, I'm really disappointed in what David did and how that fell apart. But I see Solomon come in, and I see all the language about what's happening and all the glory he's bringing, and I think we've I think we've arrived. Now, if I'm if I'm reading well, I don't I remember a everything that's happened before, and maybe I'm a hopefully a little bit cynical that this is going to stay, and b that I know God's promise we're gonna we had to learn a song about it. We had to learn the song of Moses that we're going to be driven out of the land. So if I take God at His word, I'm pretty sure this is not going to stick. But but if I'm in that land, I'm sure I'm I'm caught up with that. And I feel like yes, this is it. And we're going we're gonna to be glorious from here on out. But sin always brought them down. Sin always brought these kings down. Jeroboam was a pattern for the northern kings in the same way that David was a pattern in the good way for all the kings that were to come after him that, that did righteously. Ahab was about as low as you can go. Um, Jehu was an important king. Uh, Omri, a lot of these kings you don't read about in extra biblical literature. Omri was one. You remember he, he ruled for a very short time. He was a general that usurped. Uh, Zimri, who was another usurper. And he actually is, he appears in lots of uh, extra biblical literature because he was a very powerful king of Israel, really good military warfare um, uh, general. Uh, but you don't read about Ahab, but you read a lot about Ahab here, and it gives you a feel for what's important to the Bible. Important to the Bible is not how strong you are, it's about your character. And Ahab had a lot to be written about in terms of his character, in a bad sense. Jehu uh, w w had a lot of ink as well. Hezekiah we'll read a lot about in uh, Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is written around the story of Hezekiah. Uh, Manasseh is, is probably as low as you can go, although he repented. We read about in Chronicles. Josiah loved God with all his heart. He's, you know, the language of Deuteronomy 6 is said about, about Josiah. 
but even with that, you know, God said, even if he, Daniel, and Job were all living in Israel at the time of the, the destruction by Babylon, they wouldn't be able to save the nation, just their own lives by their righteousness. And Jehoiachin, um, you know, there's a little bit of hope you feel like at the end of Kings, you know, like you're still hoping when you read it, it's like, really? This can't be the end of the book. And then, you know, Jehoiachin, ah, you know, at the very end of the book of Kings, the king of Babylon raises him out of prison. And you think, hey, that's really good. But then you come in Jeremiah and say, don't pin your hopes on him. He's going to be, he's, there's nothing good that's going to come from him, as Frank mentioned last week. Even Gedaliah, you see Gedaliah comes and he starts listening to Jeremiah and he starts doing what's right in the land. But then he's killed by Ishmael and his friends. So it really does end with no hope, uh, the book of Kings. Major themes continued prophets, we mentioned. Elisha's at the very center of the book. Uh, Elijah as his forerunner. But there's a lot of non-writing prophets that are very integral in the book of Kings as well. And again, that sort of paves the way for the latter prophets who are going to come. Isaiah and Jonah, both writing prophets, are mentioned in the book of Kings. Uh, the idea of line prophets. So, um, you know, God is going to work through the prophets now, not kings. Kings are gone. He's going to work through the prophets. But you see Satan already beginning to sort of begin to counterfeit that and bringing lying prophets on the scene. It's just something we haven't had heretofore. They both predict and, and they fulfill. Just back in Deuteronomy, that was the, that's how you knew there was a true prophet. They were able to do that. Um, and again, we'll, re, we'll talk more about the prophets soon, but the prophets had sort of a dual ministry. It was both to explain why God was righteous and bringing the judgment he did, but also explain how God was going to care for them in the future. The temple is a major theme in Kings. Uh, it was glorious, and I've been to even the rebuilt one, and it's amazing. And in that day, it was, a, it was an amazing structure, and to think God dwelling with it where no one could even get near it because his glory was in the middle of it. Um, but again, it, he left it, and it was eventually destroyed. And even throughout the book of Kings, you see they're stripping the gold out of it and making bronze, and then they're taking the bronze out of it to sell off other kings. And so even as the... As the book goes, it's at its height and its glory with God dwelling in it in Solomon. It begins to diminish in glory all the way until it's destroyed by Babylon. They thought it was a sure defense. They thought that God would never, they were inviolable as long as they had the temple. God would never uh, allow his house to be ransacked. And, but God left it. He left his house and allowed it to be ransacked. And then ultimately it was destroyed. Okay, so this goes a little bit to Beverly's question on time period, we don't. The Bible doesn't give any specific dates, uh, very many specific dates. Um, so it'll it'll always give relative dates, like it was 480 years since, or it was 435 years since this event happened. And so, the best way we can get a, absolute dates is to see events in the Bible that are dated in other documents. So, like in Assyrian annals or things like that, and then say, okay, well, if that happened at that time. And, the, and then this happened in this many years before it, we can start to lay out a biblical uh, chronology. So there are two events that we have good extra-biblical dates for. They're battles that we get from other, again, other um, groups' uh, documents. So Battle of Karkar, and then there's a, actually a statue uh, of, that's been created of Jehu, which was one of the Israelite kings, paying tribute to an Assyrian king. And so we have those sort of uh, detailed in terms of dates that they occurred. And then we can work from that with the relative dates that the Bible gives us to sort of get an absolute chronology. So we know, based on that, that David died in uh, 970 B.C. And we know that Jehoiachin was released in 561. And then we can work backwards. We know how long David reigned. We know how long... Uh, Saul reigned. We know how long it was from the period of the Exodus through the Judges, and we can begin to make a chronology backwards. Okay, so that's what we do here, and this gets to Beverly's question in terms of how long. Um, so 1 Kings 6.1 is an important, important verse for our chronology because it explains how long, just how long it was from when Israel came out of Egypt until Solomon's reign. And so we take those battles and those things and we work back to Solomon and then we go 480 years back and we're able to get to when Israel left Egypt and went into the land. And why I call that an interpretive issue is there are a lot of critics of the Bible who would say, 
that there's no way that Israel as a people came out of Egypt in 1440. And the reasons they'll give is there's nothing in Egypt's history, you know, during that time that talks about that. Um, but one of the things that people have learned even today that the people who write history get to choose what's included. <laughs> and, you know, you don't always include your, your black eyes, you know. And so uh, there's also a question about, okay, if that's when it happened, then that means around the, you know, early 1300s, late 1400s is when they're going into Canaan and they do archaeology and they say, we don't see evidence that this massive change occurred in here. But you'll recall Israel defeated a ton of people, but they didn't defeat a ton of cities, Jericho notwithstanding, right? They lived in the houses that were already prepared for them. So they had a lot of battles and they won a lot of battles, but they didn't demolish in the way that the Babylonians did, for instance, when they came and defeated Jerusalem. Okay, so that's one interpretive issue. Uh, another interpretive issue is just the actual numbers. I mentioned those relative numbers themselves. So how long kings reigned. Let me show you a couple things that will make you scratch your head. Um, here's one. So why is it given that way? Why is it given where in one case, it's the 11th year of Joram that Ahaziah became king. And in the previous, it's in the 12th. Okay, so that's one. Let me show you another one. So we know from 1 Kings 12 that Jer Jeroboam and Rehoboam started in the same year. We also know later, many years down, that Joram and Ahaziah died in the same year. So let's now put up the numbers between those two that are given in the biblical record, why don't they add up? Okay, so in the case of Judah, if you take their kings between Ahaziah and Rehoboam, we get 95. If you take Israel's, we get 98 years. You know, why is that? Because these guys were in the same battle and died together, and then these guys started at the same time because the kingdom was split. So why, why are there differences? And the answer comes in, apparently, and this, I put up the name of the book. Let me find it. This book here, which uh, I've not read, but I have, and I and I understand the premise. Apparently, the two countries, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, used different means of reckoning when their kings became kings. So, like, as just an example, if a king started on the throne in October of 2018, when was his first year? Did he start in 2018, or would you wait till January 1st and start in 2019? Right? It was not quite like us in America where we always have the election in November and they start in January. Many times here it was because someone killed someone else and they started reigning whenever they started reigning. Right? So how do you decide? And apparently the northern and southern kingdoms use different systems of reckoning for that. So let me show you those. I mean, even in the, you'll read about that even in the New Testament period where you had different groups of Jews who reckoned Passover different and how they did that. And that impacts when Christ was crucified. So it's really not surprising. Even in our own history, you know, the, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church don't celebrate Easter on the same day. You know, there's, it's not surprising that we have differences in time like this, but it helps to explain uh, issues like this. So Judah used an accession year system and Israel didn't. And apparently, and again, I don't know how they determined this, but apparently during one period, they both used the same, and so it changed at some point. Um, and they also had a different new year. So, and then finally, you have the difficulty of co-regencies to know when it says this person reigned this long. But you remember there was a case of the, the, the child king who reigned when uh, his father, um, I, don't, I think it was Uzziah, had leprosy. So he was still alive, but he wasn't able to reign, and his child uh, became king. So it's, it's a question of, you know, how do those overlap as well? Okay, that's all for interpretive issues. Just really quickly now on a, a couple canonical links to kings. Uh, when I think about canonical links, just people uh, referencing back to kings later in the canon. So here's one uh, at the end of John. So J John is presenting Jesus as God. That's his theme. Um, he's the son of God. He's divine. And at the very end, John says that Jesus did lots of other things, which if you, want, if you tried to write them all down, all the books in the world couldn't contain them. And I think John is looking back to, to the 
to king. So John is recognizing Jesus as the king of Israel, the divine king, who's like the other kings in that he's descended from David, but he's not like them in that he's directly descended from God. He's the son of God. And he's saying, just like in Kings, at the end of every reign, they would say, if you want to read more about this king, you may look in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. John's saying, there's a lot more he did. He couldn't write them all down if he did it. There's no way. And so John is referencing back uh, to kings where at the end of every one, you know, the rest of the Acts of Solomon, whatever he did in his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? And John is, is using that same sort of language of Jesus to, to show that he is the true and final king. And lastly, um, again, we've, we've said that Kings is a very sobering negative book. It's the end of God's promises. Um, but the prophets were going to be the ones that carried the story forward. Jeremiah was one in that regard. And he wrote a letter. So, okay, there you go. He wrote a letter to those in exile. So at least Jeremiah 29, which is where uh, he begins to talk about, you know, 30 is where he begins to talk about the new covenant. He's writing to those in exile. So that at least tells us at least one group has been exiled, and that's the context of that letter. I just didn't remember that. Um, and he's writing to them saying 70 years are going to be completed uh, to this covenant. Or excuse me, seven years are going to be completed because we want the Sabbaths to, to be fulfilled for when you didn't keep the Sabbaths those 490 years uh, when you were in the land. So Daniel picks this up, and Daniel picks up Jeremiah's prophecy, and he recognizes that the 70 years are coming to an end, and he's been praying to God, asking for um, God to act because it's time. And it's really interesting that Daniel and Daniel 9, that Frank will talk about when we get to that in the Old Testament survey, Daniel and God in response to Daniel's prayer talks about how a covenant is going to be cut. What's fascinating is, again, you can see this sort of expectation of another covenant, how God always did that. Because even in the response to Daniel, he says there is going to be a cutting. Here's what's going to be cut. A covenant's going to be cut between you and the Antichrist and the, the Messiah himself is going to be cut, cut off from his people. And so God, again, takes the expectations as we're reading this and, and explains how things are going to be a little different than what your expectations are. Just like our expectations in Kings were going to be that another covenant was going to be cut with Elisha and we were going to be, you know, God was going to show his mercy again and he didn't. He quit showing mercy. Similarly, when Daniel's praying, he's expecting God to do what he said through Moses. He's going to bring the people back. He's going to cut a final covenant. He's going to change their heart. But in reality, Daniel says, that's not exactly what's going to happen. Instead, the Messiah is going to be cut off and a covenant will be cut between you and the Antichrist. And so, you know, God has his reasons for continuing this instead of uh, doing what maybe our expectations were. In this case, it's to bring uh, his promises to people beyond. He's going to bring in the church in this time. Um, but it's really interesting to see how this expectation of a covenant, which we left in Kings and which the latter prophets gave us, is even going to inform what we read in Daniel. Because covenantal theologians will, will do a great job of pointing out that's the expectation of Daniel, is that there's going to be this covenant. So that when it talks about a covenant in Daniel, it's got to be the covenant of God between him and his people. It can't be with an antichrist. And, they'll, and they do a great job of pointing out how that's Daniel's expectation. But that's the point of it, is Daniel's really surprised by the answer and and God is going to do something a little different, just like he did in Kings. So that's another uh, kind of reference back. And we know that God will cut the new covenant, and he did it through the death of Christ, and is going to fully bring it back uh, in the end days. So next week is not Kings, it's Chronicles. I must not have updated that slide. <laughs>